Thank you for the kind words, Anthony. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very meaningful occasion that we are convening the second Global Peace Economic Forum here in Manila. This is indeed a crucial time in history, as evidenced by major events across the world. The elections here in the Philippines, as well as in the US, the impeachment crisis in South Korea and Brazil, the war against terror and identity-based conflicts around the world, the existential threat and instability presented by North Korea, and even more issues. It is precisely at such times that a clear vision and exemplary leadership are needed. I would like to thank the host nation of the Philippines for its hospitality and its leaders for their genuine commitment to partnering with the Global Peace Foundation to strengthen peace and prosperity for this region and the world. The timing could not be more appropriate. As the Philippines has assumed the ASEAN chairmanship during this historic 50th anniversary. Also, thanks to the organizers and supporters of this forum, including the Chamber of Commerce of the Philippine Islands, its president, Mr. Jose Yola, as well as the former managing director general of the Asian Development Bank, Mr. Yongho Lee, I especially want to recognize former president Vinicio Cerezo of Guatemala and former president Nicolas Ardito of Panama, not only for joining us with, the, with us here today, but also sharing with us some of his wisdom in terms of the development of Panama. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank all of you for your participation in this forum. Let us give everyone here a round of applause. And of course, I cannot forget my younger brother, Sharma, who flew all the way from India. You have to actually fly back this afternoon, don't you? Who flew all the way from India because I told him you have to be here. <laughs> and I know that he's a, he's a leader in, in India in uh, bringing the transformation that's needed in that nation based upon the principles and the values that he's learning in the Global Peace Convention. Am I right, Sharma? There we go. So imagine that the world is coming together closer because of a common vision. Imagine what can be done. I believe that the last century put to rest the age-old debate of whether a centralized system or a free market is the best way forward for economic success. Even former communist nations that still maintain a single political party system have made significant efforts to liberalize their economies, to take advantage of what the, only the free markets can offer, and that centralized systems cannot. A highly vibrant, entrepreneurial, competitive environment that delivers goods and services with maximum efficiency. Just as Adam Smith observed, in his Wealth of Nations, two and a half centuries ago, the invisible hand of free markets aligns one's self-interest to the greater good of society through competitive market forces. The truth espoused in classical liberal economic theory is very simple. The freer the markets, the greater the efficiency, the vitality. Conversely, greater regulation and centralized control create inefficiencies and stifles growth. To promote innovation and entrepreneurialism, governments and their leaders must begin to build freer markets. You can give a round of applause. <laughs> However, in today's highly politicized world, especially the West and the more developed Asian nations, Many markets have moved towards more regulation and government oversight, losing touch with market-oriented economic principles. This is highly ironic 
in that the meteoric rise of the Western Hemisphere over the last 400 years was due to these classic liberal economic principles. While the East was trapped in a rigid social, agricultural, caste, or class system, the West broke from those traditions to embrace a more dynamic, fluid, and entrepreneurial system that free markets create. The shift towards greater regulation was justified by incidents of rapacious greed and unbridled abuse of the economic system, leading to efforts to make the markets supposedly, in quotes, more fair through increased government oversight. Yet government regulation stifles the very freedom that leads one to innovate and to take risks. The definition of entrepreneurialism. The ability to capitalize on timely opportunities, the hallmark of a free market, is hamstrung. The result is a closed system that benefits only those with influence and special access, while the little guy with the great idea and huge dreams never have a shot to participate in any meaningful way. Thus, here's the dilemma. How does a nation build a freer economic system that taps into innovation and entrepreneurialism, yet has sufficient regulatory and enforcement mechanisms to control, to compel actors to behave in ways that align to societal values and levels of playing field for all its citizens? <clears throat> the essential question of how to deter bad behavior has two clear options. One, either government bureaucracy provides the regulating force, or two, conscientious ethical people self-regulate based upon universally recognized principles, values, and norms, because that is what the markets and society expects. I believe the most effective approach is overwhelmingly clear to most business leaders. Most will be more concerned about the markets and their consumer backlashes than anything any government can do to their businesses. Thus, in a perfect world, the markets themselves are the best means of regulation. For they dictate which businesses provide the best goods and services that society needs, in addition to aligning to its values. If a business does not meet those market expectations, then it will no longer be competitive and eventually fail. That is why in the business community, we have all heard the truism that the consumer is king. It is the consumer of those goods and services who decide the fate of businesses as opposed to some kind of shady boardroom dealings of unscrupulous businessmen. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no shortcuts in life. For there to be sustainable, equitable, and prosperous economic systems, there must be people of conscience first, whose collective decisions advance the greater good, as opposed to benefiting just only a few. Their choices need to be rooted in universal principles and values that uplift the intrinsic God-given human rights and freedoms of all because it is in their self-interest to do so. In other words, the markets or their consumers demand it. The overarching economic approach of the Global Peace Foundation, hence, calls for less government interference in the marketplace in line with classic liberal economic principles, with, very, with one very important addition. The development of societies in which the collective ethos is rooted on a universally accepted ethic that guides the national and global economic system. Systems, remember, are values neutral. It is people that infuse those structures with their unique values perspectives, leading to varying outcomes, whether good or bad. Technologies, too, are also values neutral. In the right hands, technology can provide miraculous solutions that enable people to live more healthy, 
fruitful and productive lives. In the wrong hands, however, technologies can cause tremendous conflict, insecurity, and financial loss that are hard to quantify. Still, technological advances can liberalize and democratize the markets by providing tools and information to the average consumer. The advent of the internet and the social media provides access on a real-time basis. Information across different time zones and regions which enable consumers to make more informed decisions about businesses, products, and services. It is essential that freer markets and technology, which are the bedrock of building a well-functioning economic system, are tempered by universal moral values, as well as uncom uncompromising adherence to fundamental human rights and common decency. When leaders and citizens align to those principles and values, the nation can begin to realize its full potential to become a leading economic and moral force. I believe that the Philippines can and should become that ideal nation. Not only can it thrive economically for its own sake, but it can also lead an effort to realize ASEAN's, and as we heard from our illustrious head of the Chamber of Commerce here in the Philippines, we have many different acronyms here in the Philippines, do we not, or in ASEAN, that nobody knows what it means. But I'm glad that you know what it means, <laughs> and you were able to teach us today. In this age of the Pacific Rim region, I believe the Philippines is well positioned to play a central role. The Philippines already possesses many key attributes to assume that role. It is strategically located and has forged important ties with key nations such as Korea, Japan, the US, and China. And also, might I add, India. It has abundant natural resources, an attractive environment, and its English-speaking people of 100 million strong. Many Filipinos have already lived abroad and are influencing the local affairs of their respective nations. More importantly, I believe the Philippines can become a key trade nation, an economic hub in the larger Pacific Rim region. That is a gateway between East and West, whereby it offers distribution, professional services, and manufacturing capabilities, among others. By definition, a hub is a central part that connects multiple elements harmoniously. The Philippines has a unique history with multicultural, multi-religious, and multilingual backgrounds, so its people can interact and connect with others naturally. This is an exciting and opportune time for the Philippine nation. The 10 ASEAN member nations have combined GDP of more than $2.6 trillion and a population of 622 million in a strategically important part of the world where, whose relevance and weight will only increase with the coming years. As the Philippines currently chairs ASEAN and hence sets the tone of its discourse, this is indeed a great opportunity for it to demonstrate moral and innovative leadership. Additionally, the Philippines is on a positive trajectory. As announced at our morning session by our close partner, the Heritage Foundation, the Philippines has moved up 12 points, or 12 places, in its Economic Freedom Index for 2017. That is a solid achievement. Please give Philippines a round of applause. Let us take a closer look at the Philippines' economic and business landscape. From 2012 until now, the country has recorded a remarkable rate of growth, aided by ongoing increase in consumer spending and infrastructure investments. The GDP growth for 2016 was 6.8%, second best in Asia, just behind India. International agencies, including Moody's, are also projecting solid annual growth rates at about 6.5%. Reasonably low level of total foreign debt to GDP 
coupled with good macroeconomic fundamentals and robust economic growth, are giving comfort to international markets and rating agencies. Philippines is also among the world's top five mineral reserves countries, with mining permits currently given to only 2% of the reserve areas, which promises enormous future revenue opportunities. In other hand, on the other hand, there are also significant challenges. Chronic reliance on foreign consumers and capital goods forces the Philippines into a constant state of a trade deficit. The lack of infrastructure ranked at 95th among 138 nations by the Global Competitiveness Index also continues to weigh down the country from reaching fuller economic potential. The greatest challenges, however, are its insufficient and ineffective government bureaucracy, crony capitalism, and corruption. They prevent net value creation and discourage the spirit of innovation and entrepreneurialism. Furthermore, they stifle the growth of quality jobs and the size of the middle class, which lead to worsening income inequality between the rich and the poor. More than 50% of the population earns income less than $2 a year, and over 25% of the population lives in poverty, where over 60% of them live in remote areas away from the developed metropolitan areas. The combination of these factors leads to crime, violence, social unrest, and increasing number of those without minimum level of care and education. This is in stark contrast with the highest earners in the Philippines. According to the World Bank and Forbes magazine, the collective personal net worth of the top 50 individuals here in the Philippines was around $78 billion, which is about 25% of the country's entire GDP. Their personal wealth increased about $8 billion year over year, representing a 50% GDP dollar growth during that same period. When a country's economy grows by 7% and the majority of that wealth increase is captured by less than a thousandth of a percent of the population, that kind of economic phenomenon is not only unsustainable, it is unjust. The growth that the nation enjoys is not trickling down to the broader population because people are not plugged in to the growth areas of the economy. There are too many who are shunt out from the necessary education and opportunity, and they are locked in a perpetual state of poverty and disadvantage. This problem has to be addressed and resolved. To reduce wealth disparity while enlarging the pie for the entire population through sustained economic growth, a vibrant and robust working middle class must take root and prosper. When the few select elites control most of the wealth via a handful of large corporations, the vast majority is disconnected from the economic drivers. It is essential that more quality jobs become available through more small businesses and entrepreneurial startups. I believe the most effective way to jumpstart such a cycle and reach the desired end is through the liberalization of capital and allowing easier financial access to smaller businesses, startups, and new ventures. In essence, when capital flows freely, unhindered by unnecessary regulation or policy, into burgeoning economic opportunities, that leads to greater capital creation and results in the natural balancing of supply and demand. That is why the Philippines financial institutions, with the support of the government policies and aided by technology, should deploy more capital towards financing new growth and opportunity so that the brightest and most talented can achieve their dreams beyond the current limited landscape. Of course, there are other pressing economic issues and initiatives to tackle, such as infrastructure development, education, 
health services and building manufacturing capacity. However, whereas these areas of investment inv involve the hardware needs of the country, which can be readily addressed by securing the required capital from domestic or foreign sources, the collective mindset required for liberalizing capital is akin to developing the internal software needs where such development could take generations to take root. By their very nature, the financial industries and its government, uh, governing regulatory bodies are bureaucratic, inefficient, and risk averse. This has to change. Yet if they are unable or unwilling to develop the necessary culture and the requisite competencies to proactively evaluate risk and reward, and are unwilling to execute on calculated bets, then the country's economy will suffer and it will eventually hit a ceiling. To illustrate this case in point, look no further than to Korea, my home country. South Korea, the 11th largest economy in the world, has seen meteor meteoric rise over the last 70 years, fueled by the growth of the Chebors, or family-controlled business conglomerates. This leap to prosperity within one to two generations was unprecedented. Starting from the bottom in a devastated landscape after the Korean War in 1953, not only did Koreans catch up to the developed nations within a short period of time, they took the lead in several key industries, including automotive, construction, shipbuilding, electronics, high-tech communications, and internet services. Now, many look to Korea's miracle on the Han River as a model with envy and respect. However, while seeking maximum growth in the shortest amount of time, the marriage of convenience and the moral hazard that was created between the South Korean government and the Chebols left behind a system and a legacy that still favors the select few at the expense of the many. Over the period of extra extraordinary growth in the last four decades, the Korean economy has become even more centralized in the hands of fewer chebols than ever before. Accounting for nearly all of Korea, Korea's GDP, these chebols dominate in every industry and market, hoarding profits and squeezing suppliers while stifling the growth of smaller businesses and em that employ 90% of the labor market. Consumers are shortchanged by lack of competition, price manipulation, and corruption that follows any <clears throat> excessive consolidation of power. Most of all, the nation suffers as it is held hostage to the whims of a small elite group of Chebol families, suppressing opportunity, innovation, entrepreneurialism, and eventually hindering economic growth. The outcome speaks for itself. The significant unemployment rate of those in their 20s to 30s is one example. While Korea boosts, boasts one of the highest education standards of all developed nations, it also has one of the highest unemployment rates in this age demographic at over 10%. In turn, Growing negative sentiment toward Chebols is reaching its climax, given the environment of economic exclusion rather than inclusion, where those with the political and business relationships have an unfair advantage, leaving the mass behind to compete over a shrinking pie, not an enlarging pie. You only need to look today at the city of Seoul, where over a million people gather in peaceful protest every weekend in order to express their discontent for the corrupt and rigged system in business and politics. One should take notice when there is even a popular terminology in Korea today called Hell Chosan, in reference to the widespread perception that Korea, or its old name Chosan, offers no hope or future for an average person unless one is born rich and connected. This is made all the more discouraging 
because even the Chebors who grew on the backs of the Korean people are now losing their global standing and competitiveness to other more entrepreneurial and forward-looking players in China, in India, and here in Southeast Asia. In short, the Korean experience should be a lesson for all emerging nations. There is no shortcut to a good, sustainable outcome. There has to be sound fundamentals with which, with which to build on. In this case, creating a more robust and growing middle class of entrepreneurs and business owners through the liberalization <coughs> of capital. Even the chebols at the end of the day will benefit from this transformation because this will force them to adapt to a more competitive landscape leading to greater market discipline, fair play, and sustainability. The consumers, of course, will benefit because of improved products, services, and prices. This is what the ideals of the free market and capitalism should look like, a win-win-win solution for all of its citizens. As for the Philippines, it is now in the process of developing itself into a more industrialized country. As it looks for ways to grow economically stronger, stronger and become more relevant in the world stage, it needs to envision a new economic paradigm. Learn from those who went before you. With a new mindset, it should seek solutions that can unlock the potential of the Philippines and ASEAN. As observed in Korea's situation, a country may have all the necessary hardware, such as infrastructure, financial capital, huge corporations, but still stagnate and wither very quickly if the fundamentals aren't there. Philippine business and political leaders should cultivate a spirit of entrepreneurialism, creativity, individual responsibility, and ownership. The country should not fall into the current default state where the government and a few corporations drive all the growth. That is neither sustainable nor desirable. Instead, the entire system needs to be engaged in a creative growth process together. The key, once again, is lowering the barrier to entry in the market and stimulate free competition by efficiency efficiently connecting capital with opportunities. In other words, providing capital to all. The government's role is to ensure that there would be fair play by enacting laws which protect all its citizens in a free market landscape. Then to step back and let the market forces determine the outcome. It should never choose winners and losers or get embroiled in the trap of overregulation. Laws should be simple, but enforced vigorously so that the ideal of the rule of law, that is the foundation upon which true free markets are built, can start to take hold here in the Philippines, Asia, and the rest of the developing world. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have gathered at a momentous time in the history of the Philippines that will play a major role in shaping the economy, security, and peace of the entire region and the world. Our collective leadership going forward will be critical as it will leave behind a lasting legacy with profound and broad global implications. As leaders, we need to always be thinking long term and in the best interest of the whole based on the universal principles and values. Whether it is in business, politics, civics, or religion, leaders set the tone and direction. It is therefore crucial that we become the moral and innovative leaders of tomorrow who can chart a new path that could lead this, na this nation, this region, and the world to peace. I urge you to be those new moral and innovative leaders. Thank you very much. May God bless you and your family.